motivated by uh, by the great transition, by which I mean the transition to a net zero uh, emission energy system, uh, which is probably one of the most significant challenges that face our society. And it's hard to overemphasize how important it is. Um, so here is the plot that I think everyone has seen uh, probably many times. Um, on the left, we can see this is the um, speed of emission of CO2 every year into the atmosphere. Uh, and we see here it's, it's a clear acceleration after 1950s. Right now we emit a, a globally about 40 billion tons of CO2 into atmosphere every year. And on the right, it's the uh, cumulative effect of uh, CO2 emission over um, the observatory history uh, since the 1950s. Uh, we can see that uh, the CO2 level in the atmosphere has been consistently increasing. Right now, uh, surpassed 400, uh, 417 ppm in 2020, um, comparing to the pre-industrial level, 280. So we're heading to um, a very high level of CO2, even double the pre-industrial level. Um, of course, very publicized uh, consequences of this, um, like this cartoon here, sea level rise uh, around the world. And um, also Boston has um, uh, will face this similar issues here uh, with quite uh, consequential economic and security uh, damages to the uh, coastal area. But not just in US or uh, rich countries, uh, according to IPCC, in the past 10 years from 20, uh, 2006, 2015, uh, already 20 to 40% of the global population experienced more than 1.5 degree warming in at least one season. And most of these affected people uh, live in low and uh, mid-income countries. So this already, uh, global warming already imposed quite significant um, damages uh, to, uh, to the global society. And if we look at the current warming rate uh, by 2017, human-induced warming estimated has passed one degree above pre-industrial level. And uh, the current warming rate, uh, if continues, will surpass 1.5 degree um, with quite high certainty uh, in 2040. So um, that is a quite uh, very, very significant challenge. Uh, how to transition our energy system globally to curb temperature rise well below two degree uh, centigrade is, um, is the goal set by Paris Accord and other uh, international agreements. Uh, here are some uh, transition uh, projections. And as we see, in order to uh, limit the temperature increase well below two degree, we're probably looking at this blue curve or dotted blue curve in the bottom here, which shows a sharp decarbonization trend necessary uh, in the next two or three decades. Um, and this trend is very significant in terms of cutting down uh, emissions. Uh, 45 degree, 45 percent uh, uh, reduction by 2030 and uh, reaching net zero by the mid-century. And this is a daunting task uh, moving forward. And there are many countries in the world uh, taking pledges to cut global, uh, cut their uh, emission, um, some earlier, some later, but uh, a lot need to be done. And this motivates uh, our research and look at the uh, electric power system, which is one of the core uh, infrastructure system of, of the central importance to uh, global warming and reducing the carbon emission. So this is a um, of, uh, some data showing the U.S. electric power system emissions and uh, generation mix uh, over the past 30 uh, years uh, in, since 1990. And we can see that the uh, US system has been gradually decarbonizing, um, mainly driven by the increase of renewable energy, as well as rapid increase of uh, natural gas units. 
So both the carbon emissions and the carbon intensity of the power sector has been declining since the uh, mid 2000s. Uh, where we are now today, um, we're roughly here, uh, we're generating in the US about 4,000 billion kilowatt hour per uh, year. And uh, this electricity is generated uh, through various generation technologies. Uh, if we look at the right, uh, two, the left two bars here, the natural gas and coal uh, together makes up about 60% of the electric energy generated in US in 2020. And um, the rest is roughly uh, non fossil fuel sources such as nuclear, 20% wind, hydro, solar, and biomass. And the total renewables, if we count wind, hydro, and solar together, uh, is about 720 terawatts. Uh, and there are also a significant amount of small scale PV generation behind the meter, uh, which is not included in, in this plot but it's, 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 uh, it's significant. Um, and if we look at capacity of generation, uh, if generation capacity, then um, about 67% from fossil fuel, natural gas, and coal, and about 24% from the renewables, uh, not including nuclear, um, wind, hydro, and solar, and biomass. So um, again, the total renewable uh, capacity counting wind, hydro, and solar is about 270 gigawatts. Uh, this is uh, end of 2020. So how much more renewable will we need? Um, this is a very rough calculation. There are many studies uh, looking at this problem, this question in various angles and details of uh, modeling. So if, if we are thinking about 90% clean power grid, um, meaning 90% electric energy generated by zero emission sources, uh, in 2020, as we just uh, looked at, we're at about 38% level, meaning about 20% generated from nuclear, 18% combined from hydro, wind, and solar. And um, many pathways to reach 90% clean power grid. Um, if we make some simplifying assumptions, for example, retaining nuclear and hydro at current level and reducing natural gas to 10% of the of the current level and retiring completely to coal and with 2% annual growth of electricity, which is I think, typical in the US. And, uh, uh, and uh, there are also coming need of electrifying transportation, heating, industrial processes, which would add new electricity demand, but probably not significant. Uh, and if you consider capacity factors of wind and solar as their um, normal level of 20 to 30%, then a simple calculation shows about we need at least uh, about 1,200 gigawatt of new renewable, meaning wind and solar. Uh, if we compare what we are uh, in 2020, which is total 170 gigawatts, so we still need six or seven times more wind and solar, which also requires a significant uh, investment amount to reach that goal, and we want to reach there quite fast. So. Um, other studies um, show some similar numbers as this with more complete models, and some show even more um, requirements in a renewable uh, investment in the next couple of decades. So in any case, if we looking at a system of 90% clean uh, energy, even or above that level, uh, that will be a very different uh, system from today's power grid. So this motivates um, most of our research of looking at how to operate and plan a uh, future power grid. So here are some challenges uh, when we look at this problem from different angles. For example, from the operational perspective, uh, how to reliably operate a power system with such a high level of stochastic and intermittent renewable resources. Of course, there are also other uh, energy sources that will uh, be unconventional, uh, like uh, storage as well, um, which has its own uh, operating characteristics that uh, need to be incorporated into the operational models and methodologies. And also distributed generation uh, that making the distribution grid much more active and uh, much more um, 
complex comparing to the traditional system. If we look at a bit longer term operational scheduling problem like maintenance, uh, then uh, the conventional generators will face more wear and tear uh, to follow the uh, renewable generation fluctuations, which may lead to higher failure rates, especially we have uh, aging energy system in the US. And uh, also the weather pattern that drives the renewable energy generation may actually reduce rest season for uh, conventional generators for grid maintenance. And also if you look at longer term, there are many challenges in terms of how to expand the grid with renewables, batteries, and um, end use electrifications like uh, electric vehicles, um, and how to uh, transition our system uh, in a centralized planning as well as in market environment. And uh, so that leads to many questions in terms of market design, how to price, for example, how to price renewable uh, capacity to incentivize renewable generation, and also how to um, how to retire the current uh, generation infrastructure and how to retrofit them for uh, decarbonization. And um, in a more uh, short-term scale, dynamical challenges also abound as the power system moves toward uh, less inertia in the system and more power electronic interface uh, system than the dynamics behavior of the power system will be quite different. So that also impose very significant challenges moving forward. So um, I'd like to look at this plethora of problems from their decisions uh, structures. And for example, uh, in this talk, I will uh, focus more on the top one here, which is uncertainty that's coming into the system from both the supply side of renewable generation um, and also more complicated uh, and new uh, consuming uh, consumer behavior, as well as infrastructure failures that are um, becoming more uh, significant. Um, so this all add in uh, a lot of uh, uncertainty into the system, how to deal with that and how to operate our system under uncertainty. How the plan of system under uncertainty is a very uh, interesting and important question. And if we go down this, uh, go around this uh, Pentagon, we can also see here uh, there, are, in terms of decision structure, there are a lot of complicated decisions involving discrete decisions, uh, investment, also in scheduling of power system operation. Interior decisions usually very difficult to deal with. Um, on top of that, power system is a physical system. There are nonlinear flows, uh, physical flows that impose non-convex constraints that, uh, uh, we that cannot be avoided. So we need to have ways to deal with this. So the combination of discrete decisions in non and non-convex constraints impose uh, very uh, difficult challenges coupled with a large scale of the power system. Uh, and on the right here, have the power system is not just an engineering system, but also a economic uh, system that involves Distributed agents and markets uh, in, in, uh, in the system. Um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, nonlinear dynamics uh, is very, very um, fundamental uh, factor of risk of the power system. So, how to maintain stability of the power system in a second by second basis is also very important. So, all, all, this, all these challenges or decisions in the decisions uh, point to a uh, class of problems, which or classes of problems involve highly complex constraints uh, in an optimization problem um, with both continuous and discrete decisions and also uncertainty. So, um, so that is a, a lot of challenges and will keep uh, researchers busy and have been keeping us busy for a long time. So um, as Dan mentioned in my research, I uh, I try to look at this problem from different angles, uh, both from power engineering perspective, also from operation research perspective. Uh, operation research is enough is a 
is an academic area that uh, provides a look at uh, decision making uh, and provide decision making tools. So, what can operation research or optimization help uh, or contribute in uh, in the power system area? Uh, we can see clearly optimization and uncertainty is a very important uh, methodology, and also um, practically speaking, it could provide um, ways to improve system operations and planning. So how to design efficient and accurate computational methods for solving various optimization problems and uncertainty is uh, where uh, optimization and OR could contribute. Um, distributed decision making that we also have been working on to design algorithms that could break down a large scale, for example, grid optimization problem into zonal areas and uh, still maintain or ensure global convergence, which is probably very important for operators to have certain guarantees of, of global convergence. And, um, and uh, as I mentioned, there are a lot of physical constraints which are not arbitrary, but very structured, non-convex uh, constraints, for example, quadratic constraints with initial decisions. So uh, optimization methods for reformulating this problem and looking at, for example, rank constraints, which is a unifying framework of looking at non-convex quadratic problems, and also how to convexify such non-convex constraints is, is very uh, is very important. And uh, stability constraint optimization, uh, I won't go into much detail in this talk, but we have been looking at convexification for uh, voltage stability constraints, voltage control for frequency stability constraints. Uh, embedded in uh, power system operation. So, okay. So in the remaining part, I will uh, talk about um, two, uh, one or two uh, applications here. So this is a um, arrangement of the decision problems along the planning horizon from long-term planning problems involving multi-year or decade uh, planning uh, questions to seasonal uh, maintenance, questions. Uh, we look at sensor data-driven uh, analytics for um, generation asset ma uh, maintenance to daily operation. Uh, we'll talk uh, or focus on a robust operation of the daily power system with large-scale renewables to uh, down to uh, decentralized uh, market, multi-market joint operation and coordination and, uh, um, and real-time operation of uh, power system to maintain resiliency and uh, economic efficiency, and also uh, dynamical behaviors um, to maintain stability, especially if we look at using multi microgrids to uh, achieve stability in distribution grid. Okay, so I will start uh, from the robust unique minimum problem that we looked at. Um, and in collaboration with ISO New England, um, they are data uh, energy markets. So here is a schematic plot of the data market, um, for example, in the US. Um, time zero here is the starting operating hour of the, the day. And in day ahead means about 12 hours uh, or, or more, more be, uh, in the day before the operating time, the system operator need to solve a short-term scheduling problem or unique commitment problem to uh, gather information from generators and demand forecast to make a decision of uh, generation commitment uh, to meet demand uh, with minimum cost and satisfy various uncertainty. So the demand and supply in the unique commitment problem of day ahead uh, is certain forecast. So uh, there will be uncertainty embedded in that forecast. And uh, um, that uncertainty is uh, is intrinsic in the uh, unique commitment problem, especially as we have more wind and solar and also uh, limited ramping capabilities. It started to be very important to consider this uncertainty uh, in the data ahead planning. So um, uh, there, as everyone knows, there's a lot of uh, a growing uncertainty, as we mentioned, in uh, coming from both the supply side and 
the demand side. So the current practice of dealing with this is a, a way to, uh, it's called deterministic reserve adjustment approach, which incorporate reserve resources or um, uh, spare capacity, generation capacity uh, in the system so that uh, any disturbances uh, could be responded um, in um, a timely manner. So we are motivated by this approach and uh, the increasing uncertainty, and we want to explore possible directions to improve upon the, you know, the, the traditional uh, reserve adjustment approach, especially to explicit model uncertainty in the system and uh, uh, to endogenously determine reserve requirements, for example, considering system conditions and network constraints, and to uh, possibly reduce the amount of reserve requirements, especially uh, when we have more and more renewable energy resources. So the way that we um, approach this problem is uh, from the so-called robust optimization uh, methodology, which looks at the uncertainty in the system in a deterministic way. So by that, I mean, we we'll have the uncertainty model of the net load variation, which is a load minus variable supply. So here is the, a deterministic model of the uncertainty, meaning we're not considering probability distributions, but we are considering possible variations, deterministic variations from the load. For example, D is a vector of demand, um, which is uncertain. So we are not uh, restricting it just to be equal to D bar, which is the average or forecast load, but allow it to deviate from D bar by a certain amount, D e hat. And we also can uh, constrain how much deviation there is through this uh, first constraint here, that says total variation from forecast to the too large. And this delta T controls the size of this uncertainty set. So um, here's some illustrations of this size of the uncertainty set can be controlled by varying delta uh, T, for example. So this set contains various paths of um, net load over, uh, over the system and over time. Um, so incorporating such a so-called uncertainty set into the unit commitment problem, we can come to this formulation here. It's called two-stage robust unit commitment problem. So um, by robust, I mean, we're considering minimizing the first part of the cost, which is the uh, unit, commitment, uh, unit commitment fixed cost uh, with on and off startup and the shutdown cost. And the robustness come in the second stage here, which seeks a uh, maximum or the worst case demand realization that makes the second stage economic dispatch uh, a worst in terms of the cost. And the second stage dispatch is to minimize its own uh, dispatch cost subject to the union commitment decision and demand realization in the uncertainty set. Okay, so uh, this is a uh, two-stage robust uh, optimization problem that we propose for the unit commitment problem. Okay, so um, all the constraints of unit commitment problem need to be considered here and all the constraints that involving generation uh, levels or dispatch levels are included in the uh, minimiz inner minimization problem. Okay, okay so um, I won't go into too much detail about solving this problem. This is two-stage uh, unit commitment problem. Um, it is quite challenging to solve, but if you think about it, it actually in, uh, includes the traditional unit commitment problem as a special case, especially if the uncertainty set that we uh, have here only, con only uh, contains the nominal demand or forecast demand. Then this two-stage stochastic uh, robust problem reduces to a deterministic unit commitment with reserve. Otherwise, uh, this generalizes the uh, unit commitment problem with reserve by considering more possibilities of uncertainty. So in order to solve this, we propose a uh, quite efficient algorithm later called, uh, also called uh, column and constraint generation, the CCG algorithm, uh, which uh, is quite a different approach from Bender's decomposition. Maybe in audience, if you are familiar with solving for example, two-stage stochastic uh, linear program, Bender's decomposition is a very uh, effective algorithm. But to solve this two-stage robust optimization problem, 
standards composition actually is not very efficient. So this so-called CCG algorithm, um, you can think about it as a strengthening of standards decomposition. Instead of adding cuts, uh, single individual cuts, we actually add, we identify iterate each iteration, the worst case scenario that's found based on the cert, based on the current unit commitment decision, and add that scenario of uh, dispatch problem into the first stage problem. So this equ is equivalent to adding actually a lot of uh, vendors cuts simultaneously. So uh, so that significantly increases the um, uh, efficiency of solving this kind of two-stage robust optimization problem. Um, so how, how does it work in practice? So we have been collaborating with ISO New England for the past decade, uh, looking at their system. Uh, this is a footprint of New England system. And uh, to apply this uh, generalized you know, unit commitment problem, this robust, two-stage robust problem into their system. Um, and uh, we compare this with the reserve approach, the adjustment, uh, adjust, reserve adjustment approach uh, on their system. So here's a plot of uh, our uh, simulation on the on New England system. So the x axis here is the uncertainty level, or if you remember, uh, the set, the size of uncertainty set can be controlled by this delta t, uh, which is this uh, uh, x axis, and and uh, uh, for the reserve adjustment approach, this x-axis is how much more reserve uh, requirements we need to put into the system. And the, the y-axis is the average dispatch cost. So we solve the two types of unit commitment problem, fixed unit commitment decision, and then simulate the dispatch problem over various uh, load and uh, net load scenarios and, and compute the average for different uh, unit commitment decisions. So we see that on average, the uh, unit commitment using robust approach uh, actually is more economic uh, on average than the reserve approach by 1.8% uh, to 6.9%. This is a uh, daily saving. So uh, uh, this amounts to hundreds of thousand dollars to uh, around $1 million uh, per day of uh, economic savings to the system. And if you uh, compare this um, in a historical context, uh, the, the system transitioned from um, more manual uh, dispatch to uh, implementing economic dispatch in the early 2000s. And uh, uh, that in ISO New England and uh, New York ISO uh, lead to about 5 to 5.6% reduction in generation cost. So what we're talking about here is another step that's uh, moving ahead from the current economic dispatch and unit commitment practice to a one that considers uncertainty more explicitly using robust optimization approach, which could lead to another you know, five to 6% of uh, economic uh, improvement. Um, so there are various system benefits in addition to the economic improvement, uh, including uh, reduction of cost volatility. So this is, if you look at the standard deviation of the cost, not just the average, then by using a robust approach, the end result of uh, economic dispatch could actually have much lower standard deviation, which means the, uh, the system volatility is being reduced quite significantly uh, to order of magnitude compared to the traditional approach. Also, the robust optimization approach does not have a assumption, does not make assumption about, for example, load uh, probability distributions or um, the renewable generation probability distribution, which may be actually quite difficult to characterize. So this also shows a robustness against you know, model uncertainty in the system. So, um, so this is the approach that we have been working with uh, ISO New England. And um, um, we also look at how to uh, extend this two-stage robust unit commitment problem to more realistic settings. For example, one extension is actually to look at, can we actually implement a two-stage robust unit commitment decision? So here is a very simple two-bus system. We have bus A and B, 
each bus has its own generator and, and, and load, and they are connected by a transmission line with certain gener uh, transmission capacity. And the generators also have ramping limits. So the ramping capability sometimes is a bottleneck of system operation. Um, if we apply robust two-stage robust equipment model to this problem, then it will give us a policy of how to dispatch the two generators. In uh, here, we only consider two time intervals, time interval one and uh, time period two. So if you look at this policy that's provided by the two-state robust uh, unit commitment, you can see that for each generator A and B uh, in, for example, period one, their dispatch level actually need to be dependent on the demand realization of um, the second period. So here demand is uncertain, but um, depending on what demand realized, um, then uh, that will uh, be used to calculate the dispatch level of the generators. But the funny thing here is the generation level of period one actually need to depend on the demand level of period two, which is not known to the generators at period one. So um, this is called uh, anticipatory policy, meaning you're anticipating what the true demand is uh, when it actually has not really realized. So um, this would lead to problems if we implement such uh, policy. So uh, for example, in this simple case, we can show that there is actually no uh, feasible non-anticipatory policy, meaning policies that only depend on the information that you have when you make that policy or make that decision. So uh, this shows some intrinsic difficulty with uh, the two-stage decision structure. Um, so what we uh, have been uh, working on is to extend this uh, two-stage to a multi-stage uh, decision structure, which explicit, explicitly models this so-called non-anticipatory policy or um, respect the causality. So for example, here the dispatch of generator um, I at time t can only depend on the demand observation up to time t. So this d of superscript uh, bracket t here means this is the demand vector of all the demand realized up to time t, not including demand in the future. So this is a, this is a non-anticipatory policy. And um, uh, here we're using a simplified uh, policy structure only uh, involving affine uh, structure. So the dispatch level is an affine function or linear function of the uh, of the net load. So this is a simplification. Um, but this improves upon the uh, two-stage uh, robust unit commitment in terms of uh, economic uh, efficiency. So here is some computational uh, results. We have done this quite extensively. Um, this is a large system of uh, 2,000 buses. So we're comparing affine policy unit commitment with multi-stage stochastic unit commitment on the first row. And then the second row is a two-stage robust UC that I just introduced earlier. And the bottom one is the determinist UC reserve uh, and look ahead economic dispatch. So we look at various, um, various sizes of uncertainty sets and, um, and uh, study what is the average performance of robust and uh, reserve approaches, and what is the volatility or standard deviation of the performance, what is the penalty uh, frequency. So we can see that if we choose the proper level of uncertainty set size, so this sort of choosing the proper level of risk averse level for an operator, uh, then comparing to two-stage and uh, deterministic UC, we can see significant um, savings in terms of uh, average cost. So comparing to the two-stage that I discussed in more detail, a multi-stage uh, policy could actually save 1.23% uh, slight saving, but comparing to deterministic approach uh, with reserves, the saving is quite significant, about 24% in this, uh, in this case. So this shows a practical um, benefit on the average. So this is not a worst case study. This is an average study. So it shows robust optimization is not uh, conservative if we choose the right 
size of uncertainty or to choose the right model of decision structure. Another extension very quickly is to uh, incorporate dynamics in uncertainty. So um, if you remember the uh, uncertainty set that I introduced for the two-stage setting is a, uh, is, is a set that just look at variations from the um, nominal demand. But if we look at uh, for one period, but if we look at multiple periods together, then the uncertainty set um, could model something of uh, correlation between uncertainties. For example, wind speed at uh, time t may actually correlate to its wind speed in the previous time period. Uh, also, spatially, uh, wind farms in uh, adjacent uh, locations may actually depend or correlate with each other. So we could model uh, such a correlation of uncertainty over both time and space uh, to, to look at and certainly sets that uh, incorporates uh, such uh, uncertain, uh, uncertainty vectors over, over time and space. So here is a more concrete example of dynamic uncertainty set for wind speed. So here I'm looking at wind speed of adjacent wind farms at time t as a uh, r of t. That is the wind speed uncertainty, uh, uncertain wind speed, which has certain patterns that can be estimated which is g of t, and the remaining one are the uncertainty part. But the uncertainty of uh, time, uh, uh, time t could actually be correlated with previous time periods and with other uh, adjacent wind farms. So here we use a, um, a linear constraints. Uh, you can think about this autoregression constraints in uh, forming this uncertainty set. So in this way, we can combine statistical models uh, with uncertainty models and use this in uh, robust optimization models for operating a power system with, for example, renewables, wind and solar. So, um, so we, we implemented this and tested this in a um, rolling horizon robust economic dispatch problem. Also think about this um, uh, as a uh, look ahead uh, economic dispatch. So we look at we start from one time period and looking forward a fuel time period. And each time period could be 15 minutes or 10 minutes or five minutes. So this is a real time uh, economic dispatch setting. And what's it's very interesting to see is this plot. So this shows a um, plot of uh, cost standard deviation. So this is standard deviation of the simulation results of, of the cost. And the y-axis is the average. So this is average versus standard deviation. And um, uh, we can see that if the, the dots, dot is, the dot is a, is a methodology simulated over a uh, long-term horizon. So on the, if the, if the uh, dot is toward the northwest corner here, that means it has both high cost and also high standard deviation. So high cost and high risk. And the dot to the, to the lower left corner here uh, has low cost and low standard deviation. So uh, what we found is this dot right in the up right corner here is the current practice. So it involves both high cost and also quite volatile um, output. Uh, so um, because the uncertainty is not really modeled in an explicit way. But using the proposed robust approach, with the dynamic uncertainty set, and um, uh, we can also tweak the, the, the dynamic uncertainty set in various ways. Uh, we can see that both the standard deviation and the average cost can be significantly reduced uh, by using robust approach. And also very interestingly, and this shows that up to a certain point, uh, the reduction uh, can be done, but then it will hit a Pareto frontier, meaning this red curve here shows that up to a certain point, you have to trade off the stability or, or risk of your system with the cost. In order to reduce further the risk or the standard deviation of, uh, of your cost, you need to pay more uh, in order to achieve that. So this, this red curve here uh, is a frontier uh, that cannot, that is any point up here is not dominated by other points. 
So, so this does show that intrinsically we could have think about you know, using this um, to couple with, to model, for example, system operators risk preference uh, in the system and to choose a point of operation that is consistent with uh, risk preference and also consistent with the expectation of cost. All right, so in the next, uh, see there, is there any questions so far? I think we can do questions at the end, Andy. Okay. So, okay, thank you. Let's do that then. So, um, so this, uh, this slide shows a um, implementation of the two-state uh, robust uh, Unicamina model in the, in the ISO New England market. So um, what they do is they build a so-called do not exceed limit uh, model that uh, calculates using robust optimization approach to calculate uh, allowable wind, for example, for wind, allowable uh, wind generation levels uh, in data hack. So that will be a uh, used as a guidance for wind resources to feed into the market. And this has been implemented uh, in the ISO New England system. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a very uh, nice way to use robust optimization to guide market operation. Um, okay, so in the remaining about 10, uh, 12 minutes, I will um, briefly cover this long-term planning problem because I think it may be interesting uh, to the audience in terms of this methodology that we developed. So, um, I think we all know that uh, as this MIT uh, future of the electric grid study pointed out, the existing planning methods cannot do multi-period optimization and the uncertainty for networks with anything approaching the complexity of Eastern or even the Western interconnection. And this has been a few years, so there are already you know, progress in, in the field that uh, uh, toward this, this, this direction, but there's still quite uh, significant computational challenges in terms of uh, how to solve you know, multi-period optimization and uncertainty uh, with network constraints, with complicated constraints. Uh, so developing computational tools that can exploit uh, new hardware, but also al algorithm software improvement uh, is a very important, interesting direction. So uh, we have been working in this direction in terms of developing new um, algorithms for solving multi-stage stochastic optimization problems. So here is a very simple uh, problem of generation expansion. So this is a deterministic model, and it's a very simplified deterministic model. If we look at over a t time horizon, we want to determine what is the minimum cost and minimum way of investment, uh, which is the first part, and also generation. So X is the investment decision and Y is the generation decision based on the investment that we make. You think about this is a generation expansion decision versus generation dispatch decision. So we need to satisfy certain logic constraints. For example, your generation cannot uh, be more than what you actually built in the system. And there may be certain upper bound of various types of generators that you can build over time horizon and also uh, supply good demand. We also incorporate transmission constraints here. So this is a deterministic problem. All the parameters are deterministic, but if we consider stochastic data, for example, generation cost may be quite volatile, connecting to fuel cost, for example, um, and uh, investment cost could also be volatile, and also demand could be quite stochastic. Uh, then we can formulate a stochastic optimization problem. And, and in particular, we're looking at a multi-stage stochastic optimization problem, meaning similar to the multi-stage uh, robust problem we discussed earlier. So the uncertainty evolves itself or reveals itself over time. So the decision that I make in this year can only depend on decision in the past. It, it only depends on the uncertainty that I observe in the past, cannot depend on the future. So uh, here is a representation of uncertainty uh, evolution in the scenario tree, starting from current period, which is the node one here. Uh, we need to make certain decision about what to do right now in terms of, for example, generation uh, expansion and, uh, and generation dispatch. And then in the future period, 
the de demand and others, the casting data, uh, will have different uh, scenarios or different realizations. Depending on each, we need to make or we could make adjustment to, for example, generation or investment. And this goes on for each time period. So you see that this will give us a tree that goes from uh, the first time period all the way to the last time period. Okay, so this is called a scenario tree. And uh, in each node of the scenario tree, there will be a nodal optimization problem there, uh, sitting there looking at for my current period, given what has happened from the root node leading to my current node here, that unique path of the realization of uncertainty, and looking forward what could happen with possible uncertainties uh, looking in the future, what to do right now. So you can also think about this as a, a dynamic programming, uh, a stochastic dynamic programming uh, formulation. So how to solve such problem uh, is quite challenging. So um, what we uh, have uh, developed in, in the past few years uh, is a way to uh, solve such a problem uh, in um, using cutting points. So it's called stochastic uh, do dynamic integer programming. So the name doesn't matter, but what we do is uh, first to do stochastic sampling on the tree. Since the tree can be actually very huge, especially have a lot of uh, scenarios and a lot of uh, long uh, uh, planning horizon. So the tree is huge. So what we do is do stochastic sampling on the tree. And then um, uh, for each sample of, of the scenario, It'll give us the path in this in the scenario tree. Then we need to think about how to solve the multi-period problem there. And this problem involves integer decisions because we're talking about investment uh, and expansion, so uh, or retirement. So so there are integer decisions, the so-called integer recourse decisions. So then the traditional approach of vendors decomposition or nested decomposition cannot guarantee convergence or cannot guarantee accurate solution because of the integer decision. So we develop certain um, algorithm that actually could close the automatic gap. So in a sense, there is a strong duality of integer program that uh, we discovered in the core of the algorithm. So I, I, I just leave it here in this level, but if you're interested, I can definitely uh, send you rather papers. Um, I want to show that this approach is quite uh, efficient. So the, the simple stochastic, multi-stage stochastic expansion problem for six, seven, eight, nine time periods could involve up to 10 to the 12 variables. So this is absolutely impossible to solve uh, using any solver today. Uh, so that, that, that's why it's necessary to develop uh, decomposition algorithms and stochastic sampling algorithms. So using this, stochastic sampling and decomposition algorithm that we develop, you can see that this huge problem could be solved in, in a PC, in a personal computer, uh, in about three hours maximum to reach a certain uh, optimatic level of 1% uh, optimatic level, this combining various uh, algorithm designs with cutting plane algorithms. So um, here's a convergence uh, behavior of the algorithm. It converges in about 40, 50 iterations. Um, it has, it could be applied to um, many applications, not just expansion planning, but also unique minimum problems that we looked at. Um, also storage management problems, which cross, uh, it's important to consider multi-time periods. Um, and um, also interestingly, that this approach actually is scalable over time periods because there is an open question to ask if the multi-period or multi-stage expansion or investment problem uh, has more and more stages then is this algorithm that we developed or any algorithm uh, will become exponentially more time consuming uh, when you have more decision stages right so in other words uh, does the complexity of the algorithm depend on the number of decision stages in a polynomial way or in an exponential way? Okay, so um, uh, we recently settled this question to show that the algorithm that we developed actually could uh, leads to a polynomial uh, 
complexity. So that means the number of iterations of this algorithm depends only polynomially on the number of stages. So it won't have this exponential explode uh, of uh, complexity. And more interestingly, uh, if your state space is finite, uh, or if you consider a relative uh, accuracy that can scale with the number of decision stages, then the complexity actually is linear uh, in the number of stages. So this gives some hope that the methodology that we're developing or other methodologies could be developed for solving multi-stage stochastic optimization problem in an efficient way, at least efficient in terms of the number of stages. So we could expect to solve really long horizon uh, planning problems. Okay, so I think I will uh, just stop here. I have other uh, things prepared, but I think this may be a good uh, time to, uh, to stop. And I would like to you know, answer any questions. Thank you very much, Andy. I think there are some questions in the chat so people can ask. I think Dan would start with, I'll skip my question. I'll talk with you later. But Dan, you want to ask your sure. question? Sure. So, so Andy, I just had a question that how did you like determine the right size of your uncertainty set? Yeah. It's kind of, yeah. So, yeah. Right, right. So, so um, that's, that's a great question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the uncertainty set definitely uh, matters in terms of the performance. If you're, mm -hmm. uh, if the size of the uncertainty set is too large, then you become uh, quite conservative. Uh, if it's too small, then you don't have enough protection to the uncertainty. So there actually is um, a um, a body of work that's developed in the past few years in terms of how to determine the size of the uncertainty set using uh, a statistical uh, methods or uh, so roughly speaking the size of, of the uncertainty set uh, actually gives you can be linked to the probability of violation of the uh, constraints because you're you have uncertainty and certain parameters so um, there is a precise way to link the size of the uncertainty set to what is the probability that's or what is, what is the risk of of your um, of that constraint, um, given right. any probability distributions, so so that could be used as a way to um, to set the answer to that size. Uh, I can get to yeah. some some uh, recent literatures. Um, uh, great, uh, I think Subir Manum there. Do you want to ask a question? This is sort of elephant in the room question for robust optimization, but uh, I don't know if Sumir is Subir is still there. Of uh, my question, I think uh, uh, Dr. Andy has already answered. This is kind of linked to uh, Dan's question. And uh, so the thing is like that, that our, our robust optimization guarantees performance under the worst um, uh, uncertain scenario, right? Yeah. And um, however, that such as worst case scenario doesn't always materialize. And there is always need to, you need to basically uh, think about that. Well, what is the, what is the uncertainty scenario that you have to choose? And then you have just mentioned, right? So there are statistical methods that, um, you know. Yeah, right. Thank you. And I think there is a similar question, but maybe we so, uh, put those to rest. Rong Peng Liu was asking, uh, Rong Peng, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Would you uh, state your question? I think it's related to the previous two questions. Uh, yes, uh, uh, hello. So the first yeah. one, uh, uh, I would like to know the difference between the robust optimization method and the distributionally robust optimizers method. And uh, I, I, uh -huh. I want to uh, learn your insights about the application scopes of these two kinds of methods. Thank you. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So um, the distribution robust uh, optimization is, um, if I understand you correctly, is the model where you consider uh, probability distributions, but uh, you also consider the ambiguity or the uncertainty of the probability distributions. Right? You consider a, a set of probability distributions of the underlying probability distribution. For example, you have, you have a wind, uh, you want to characterize wind generation, <coughs> probability distribution of wind generation, but that may be difficult, so you actually consider uh, a, a range of probability distributions for that. So um, 
I think it, it definitely is a, is a generalization of robust optimization. You can think about robust optimization is a special case of that in terms of, I'm not considering uh, any distribution, but, but uh, just distributions that, that focus on each single point. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's a more general methodology. Uh, I'm also uh, working on this uh, more general methodologies, um, and it also involves different uh, you know modeling uh, modeling assumptions. Like you need to sort of estimate distribution using data, uh, with you know using some data driven approach. Um, I, think, I think that Sheila Gang had a very similar question. So maybe we state that question, and maybe you can elaborate more. Sheila, are you there? Yes. Yes. Uh, my question yeah. is more uh, very uh, related to the previous question yeah. Yeah. and uh, probably a uh, long existing question. So what do you think are the pros and cons of the robust framework and versus the probabilistic framework where you incorporate the distribution? Uh, yeah. Of the yeah, I think the same question. Yeah, right. Right, right, right. right. No, I, I think these are very actually closely related. I think people tend to think them as separate, but I think, you know, more and more these two approaches become very intrinsically uh, related. For example, as I mentioned, the robust uh, framework, uh, you say you use uncertainty stats, you didn't explicitly consider any public distribution, but it turns out that that uncertainty stats actually can give you probabilistic guarantees against probability, various probability distributions. So, uh, on, on the other, uh, so in other words, the, the, the robust, let's call it deterministic robust approach that I presented here in the first part, uh, versus the distribution a robust approach versus the, the probabilistic or stochastic setting. These are all quite actually closely related um, because you know the distribution a robust setting could actually be reformulated as a deterministic robust problem. And the deterministic robust problem could give you stochastic guarantees or probabilistic guarantees that link to you know stochastic formulation. I think you know this this um, uh, this this, this sort of shows that there is a unifying uh, framework where uh, that points to the way that, okay, the traditional stochastic programming only considers, say, one probability distribution, but you could consider more probability distributions in it. Right? Uh, and that, you know, in a distribution of robust setting, for example, that, that's linked back to the, to the, to the um, deterministic robust approach. So, so um, Andy, just maybe one question from me, and I think we need to finish. Um, I am, uh, when you do these centralized optimizations yeah. under uncertainties in general, yeah. and you get out uh, locational marginal prices, how ah. can you justify them? That has been an open question forever. So where do we stand with that? Yeah, right, right, right. That, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, so, um, I think I think a lot need to be to be understood. Uh, I don't have a good a good answer. Um, so basically, if we say consider various scenarios, then the then the locational marginal prices computed for different scenarios will be you know very different. Will be very different, and it may not be realized you know in practice. How is that going to affect your you know how you set the price? Uh, of your current period, yeah. I, I, I'm asking. I'm asking even a more pointed question. You know, different stakeholders contribute to these uncertainties very different ways, yeah, and I have right. to give my own uh, bias. Yes. You know, at, uh, in our group, we are pursuing distributed integration of uncertainties, so in the bid versus giving it to system operator. Um, yeah. I wonder if you have any thoughts because then LMP is well defined. Right, right. I think also that's related to the question of, you know, who bears the cost of uncertainty. Right. As, as you said, you know, different wind and solar has all the uncertainty there, where other genders have little. So that is, uh, is it fair to say that um, maybe the research community should pursue both and compare them or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That, I think a similar situation happens, for example, for a reserve, right? Like Yes, yes, yes. That, okay, that's great, it. great. I think that we have to unfortunately stop. Andy, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank and you so much. Uh, if people have any questions, you can end this email. I don't know if you don't mind. Andy, oh, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah.
if you have, if you have questions, please send me uh, email or I'm, I'm happy to discuss offline. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.